a while, but I think I'm ready. Okay. Yes, I'll make that font bigger. Right. So, um, you'll tell me when we're live? Yeah. Oh, we're live? Okay, <laughs> good. So, uh, yes, my name is John Layden. Um, I, uh, I'm in physics, I actually research icicles, and um, this is a tutorial on command lines in general, but we're specifically using bash. Um, you can, uh, if you've got bash installed, you should be able to follow along just fine. So we'll start off with the question, why use a command line? Um, really, uh, the command line is just a really precise and powerful way to interact with the computer. Um, because it's a scripting language, you can perform really complex tasks without much overhead. I like to think of it more as I'm talking directly at my computer rather than just pointing with gestures. Okay, sometimes pointing at something is faster than saying, can you please pass the salt? But people understand you better if you speak, right? Um, so at first, it's, it might feel a little cumbersome, but like learning any language, you tend to pick it up, or you get to be able to do more and more with it, express more, and because it's English-based, it should actually uh, be picked up fairly quickly. So, um, like I said, we're focusing on Bash in this lesson. Uh, Bash stands for Born Again Shell. There are a few other uh, shells that are out there. Hi. Uh, pretty much any, their command line interface shell are kind of interchangeable. Um, we've got some other more modern shells would be ZSH or ZSH. Um, Fish, the friendly interactive shell, that's one that I use from time to time. It's got fancy stuff like uh, color coding command line arguments. And all the features you expect from 1994. Uh, RC is a plan 9 shell. Uh, that's kind of a post Unix thing. It's interesting because it adds a lot of functionality, but most people will never use it. And then PowerShell is uh, it's like command.exe on Windows, but it's the better version of it. It's not based on the born shell like all of the other ones, so some of the things covered in the lesson don't carry over directly, even though it has a lot of the same functionality. So, um, Bash is a command line interpreter. Pretty much every command line interpreter works on uh, units of code called commands. So um, the general syntax is that you have a command name with three M's according to this, followed by uh, some arguments, maybe some arguments, maybe not. So some examples of commands are ls for listing files, state, stuff like that. Um, I'll just move this to the side so that we can try out some of them. So ls shows the list of files that are in the current directory. OK, I'll jump to cd. That changes the directory. So if I go cd uh, lessons bash, oh, I need to check out. So if I see into lessons, bash intro, then I can see the lesson and a few demo files. I can change directory into the demo file. Um, I'm not actually going to RM because I don't actually want to remove any of these files right now. Um, there's date, which tells you the date. Um, there's man date which is a pun that I like, but it's a uh, man. It shows you all of the information on how to use date. And as you can see, there's quite a bit because dates are complicated. 
Okay, you can press Q to exit that. Um, you've got stuff like Vim, which if you've got Vim installed, will open up the text editor. Unfortunately, my escape key is starting to break, which is about the worst thing for someone that uses Vim. Said, I'm going to skip the E because it's not strictly necessary here. Cat, dog, and um, G means global, and I'm going to use animals instead of pets file. And so you can't really see what happened there, but it actually changed set as a streamline editor. You can use it to do search and replace quickly. Echo is nice and basic. It just repeats what the command line argument. Um, find is a, that find the command will actually remove all of the Python files from the current directory and any subdirectories. Uh, which will tell me which Python executable I'm going to run. And then cat shows the contents of files. Okay. There we go. So in, in these, the first, the first word is always the command, and then everything that follows it is an argument. And arguments are separated by spaces. So uh, there are some arguments that activate and deactivate options. These can be called flags or switches. Um, so in these examples, uh, dash E is a flag or a switch. Um, sometimes they can be longer than one character, or ls-a is, uh, is a list all the files, and including hidden files. Sometimes they can be more than just one character, like a full word. So in that find, um, in this find line here, you can see that there's a dash not, dash name. Oh, sorry, that removes all files that are not Python files from the directory. So dash not, dash name, um, those are uh, flags. Usually they have two dashes. In this case, they don't. Uh, most, mo most newer commands will use two dashes for longer options as a default. Sorry, just so on the lesson, uh, the sheet, that goes to the file that you need. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so later on for a few of the demos, I've got some files already set up to illustrate things. Um, by, the, by the time some people view this, it might also be uh, on our website. Okay, so that was just kind of a smattering of lots of commands. Some of them will show you how powerful it can be. But um, I'm going to just highlight uh, some of the commands that I use most commonly, like listing files, changing directories, copying, moving, making directories, removing files. And then head and tail are good for um, looking at the contents of files. Grep is a very powerful search tool for the contents. And man, which is possibly uh, the most useful one is for manuals. So um, it's the difficulty starting off the bat is remembering which command does what. And although they seem rather cryptic, there's kind of a naming scheme. There's a general naming scheme to most. So um, most of the really old Unix commands will use the first two consonants of the word that describe what they do. So copy is CP. Right, copy is CP, list for list files is LS, move is MV, remove is RM. OK, 
Okay. Others are acronyms or abbreviations like change directory, man for manual. Um, we saw said earlier that's stream editor. And so those things will hopefully help you remember things. Grep has a very useless one. It's, um, it's based on uh, a rather complicated acronym that I don't even remember but RE stands for the regular expression. Um, it's something regular expression and print. Okay. Um, so as, as I've, I've kind of described the behavior of most of them, um, but there's some common flags to use. So I'll go back to having this on the side, except it doesn't fit well. Okay, so um, if we check man ls, then we'll see that there are a whole bunch of different options. And this will format your all of the output in various ways. Okay, but um, a common one is ls-a, which shows hidden files as any file. So um, here we have dot and dot dot, which is the current directory and the parent directory. Those normally aren't shown when you list files. If I make a hidden file, it doesn't show on the ls, but if I do ls-a, we should see dot hidden here. Okay. Um, there's also dash L. I use this one a lot if I want to just know all of the information. It shows uh, your permissions on the files, read, write, and execute, um, or what those stand for. The user, the group, that happens to be the same in my case, the size of the file, the date of the last change to it, so you can see one of them was done one minute after the others. Um, and then the name of the file. Okay. If you use H with it, it makes the size of the file a bit more human readable. Um, and then sometimes if, you're, if you've got to clean up large files. Yeah, so here animals um, is 3,768 bytes, okay. right? And down here, it says 3.7 kilobytes. Right. So it only affects that column? Or yeah, H just affects that column. It's, okay. uh, I think of it as H for human readable. It uh, uses right. megabytes, stuff like that. You can also um, sort them by size. But you can sort them by a lot of different things, but size is uh, the one I use most commonly. So the list of minerals that I pulled from Wikipedia is the longest at 22 kilobytes. Um, and then some of these are actually just empty files at the bottom. OK? Right. We have um, changing directories. So uh, we've already seen changing directories. It's C, uh, CD, and then I'll clear that so it's at the top of the screen. It's CD for change directory, and then whatever directory you want to change into, like source. Um, there are a few uh, quick things that a lot of people don't see. Like if you want to change to your home directory, you can use tilde or the squiggle. But you can also, on most systems, just use CD with nothing else, and it'll bring you to your home directory. So I use that a fair amount. And then the one that I find most valuable is CD dash, which brings you to the last directory that you are in. Yeah, yeah. So it's super useful. Um, there are com there are other commands that people will talk about, like popd and pushd which do similar stuff, but that's only if you need to go back in history more. So cd dash is kind of a 
big help. <laughs> um, copy and moving files. Uh, so the example here is that I can copy A and B. Here I have into C, but I would do it into source. So cp a.py b.py into source. OK. And then if I look in source, with ls, you don't need to, it doesn't need to be the current directory. It can also be point to any directory in your system. So if I ls the source directory, then I can see that there's a.py and b.py in there. OK, I can remove those. Undo it. Um, and you can also uh, move files. And you can move files into a directory. Uh, so that would work the same way. Into source. OK. But um, so if I look in my current directory, I no longer have A or B. If I look into source, then I have A and B there. Um, so I'll just move them back for now. Uh, source, and the, um, another thing is most of the time you can use up arrows to go up through history. It's another useful thing. So I'm just going to change that to move it into the parent directory. So you can see A and B are back. OK. The one big thing that I want to warn everyone about is that uh, using CP and MV will overwrite uh, files without warning you. So um, one error, one mistake that I make uh, all too often is forgetting to put in the destination. So if I just wanted to move A and B, uh, into source, and I forgot to do source. No errors or warnings are given, but if I look, A is now gone, because and B is actually what A was. So it overwrote B without doing it, just because I forgot to put in that destination directory. OK. Um, luckily, they were both empty. So I'm just going to recreate an empty. Uh, okay. OK. Um, the same thing is true with remove. If you remove a file, it doesn't go into your trash bin or uh, recycle bin or whatever on your operating system. It just gets deleted. Um, and it's uh, quite annoying to get those files back. So uh, those are the kind of things that you have to be more careful of when you're using the command line interface. Um, there's. Uh, in those particular things, there's less uh, tolerance to error. OK. Um, the one thing to point out is that uh, directories won't be removed. Forgot a parenthesis, close parenthesis. Anyway, directories won't be removed um, if you try to remove them. Um, it'll say, cannot remove it. It's a directory. OK, I'll put that towards the top of the screen. So source is a directory, SRC. I can't remove it. Um, but if I, and if I look inside of source, there's something in it. There is an RM, DRI, RM dir command <laughs> uh, for remove directory. Um, it also won't work because the directory is not empty. So most often, uh, you'll just use RM dash R SRC. And so if I look, there is no source directory anymore, and all the contents of it are gone. Okay, So that's another thing to be very careful with. Um, even worse, you can uh, force it to also remove protected files and stuff like that. So I'm just going to. Uh, Oh, 
pull it back from the Git repo. One reason why Git is good. <laughs> okay, good. So um, the other stuff that's quite useful is looking in files. So um, if I'm searching for files, one way to manually do it would just be to open the file in a text editor, look through it, or search in the text editor, and do that over and over again. You can do this from the command line. So if I want to see the first 10 anim animals in the file, I can type in head animals, and I can see 10 animals. Okay. I can do the same thing with looking at the last 10, say, minerals. All starting with Z. Okay. You can change the number that you see with N. So if I only want to see two, I can do that. Okay, so tail dash N two animals. Um, if I remember correctly, there doesn't have to be a space there. But I yeah. Hmm? Yeah. you need the N. Yeah. Um, because if you don't do the N, it will say uh, two isn't a directory, or two isn't a file or a directory. Okay. Um, and then uh, you can also use grep. And um, there are lots of options to grep, and it uses regular expressions, but uh, the kind of novice way to do it is just type in the word you're searching for, followed by the file name. So if I grep for a pony in animals, I get surprised to see that pony isn't an animal on Wikipedia. <laughs> At least it's not in the list of common animals. So, but if I instead do grep cat in animals, then I see there's a bobcat, a saber-toothed cat, and a wild cat. Um, grep is case sensitive by default. <laughs> So then they're all the ones that start with a capital C. Okay. Um, I can also try that. That's one way of making it case insensitive. And if I look at uh, man grep, Uh, there, ignore cases dash i. So, grep dash i cat in animals, and it'll give me everything that has a uh, cat in it, whether or not it's capitalized. Okay. And uh, man, which we've been using a few times over for manuals. Um, the general uses, usage is just man and then the name of whatever command you want to use. Um, I don't think I've got that installed right now, but man wc, for instance. So wc is a command that it prints new line, word, and byte counts for each file. And then it describes what it does has all the arguments. Sometimes they'll have examples of how you might use it. So if you ever get into a situation where you don't know how do you, you can't remember what that argument is for the command, that's one of the best ways of doing it. Do you know this is actually in uh, man? Um, yeah, so uh, we'll kind of see this later, but man uses program to show the manual files. It's called less. And so anything that you use, it's called less because less is more. And it's going back to past months. So um, most of the time, you can just scroll up or down. Page up and page down work as you expect. Um, Q will quit it. But if you use uh, slash, the forward slash, then which you can see at the very bottom of the screen, then you can type in whatever you want to search for. Mm -hmm. Mines, 
say, and it'll go to the first instance of that. You can press N to go to the next one, but it's not found, or capital N to go to the previous. So if I do it with a more common character like E, and those are all the E's, and I can press N to go to the next line that has an E, and capital N to go back. It's the same behavior as you have in bin. Um, if there are any people that use VI for their text editor, that's where VI gets it from. Okay. Good. So, um, as we've seen, a lot of what you can do with the command line is uh, working with files. And um, files just get provided as a command line argument. The name of the file does. Um, and so file names are, or the arguments are actually also called path names. That's because it includes the full directory to the file and the file name. Um, we've actually already seen a lot of this. So um, relative, the path name is generally relative to where you are in the system. So if I'm in this, you can see in uh, my prompt, where I am in the system. Um, but you can also find that out with PWB, or present working directory. So um, if I uh, look inside the current directory, or if I look inside source, there's this file, myscript.py. OK? So I'm going to skip making a file. Uh, but I can just uh, list the files in source and see my script.py. If I change into source and ls source, because my current working directory is different, that src doesn't exist here. Right? So if I want to look into, into the same one, and I just type in ls because I'm the current one. That makes sense to everyone? Um, I think I'll also add, uh, so I'm in this source directory that's in the demo directory that's in the bash intro. You can access uh, parent directories using dot dot. So I can go dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot. And then that's showing me all of the lessons that are in this Git repo, OK? But uh, as you can imagine, it gets a little confusing how many levels you've gone up. And if you accidentally add an extra dot or only have one dot or have two slashes, thing, extra slashes doesn't usually do much, but it gets complicated. So. Um, often you will use absolute paths. Okay. So absolute paths um, go from uh, a directory at the root of your file system. On Unix file systems like you have on Max or uh, Linux, everything starts at uh, slash. So if I ls slash, that's showing me everything in the root directory. Most Unix systems will have a very similar list of things here, particularly bin, proc, mount, user, bar, temp, etch, or et cetera, all that kind of stuff. Okay, And you can access any file from this hierarchy. So if I go ls slash home slash jlayden slash study group, oh, sorry, source study group lessons slash intro demo. Then I've accessed the parent directory. It's absurd to go through that much um, in your absolute files, but if this is particularly useful if you need to get to something in somewhere else in your home directory and copy it in. So if I wanted to copy my bash RC, 
I could go home, be late in RC and copy it here. And then I now have a hit, new hidden file in this directory. Okay. Um, and because most of the time you'll be, unless you're a sysad, sysadmin, you'll be grabbing stuff from your home directory, there's a short form for that, which is tilde. So I'll clear that again. So if I ls tilde, then it shows what I've got in my home directory. I can also do dash a to show all of the hidden files in there as well. Okay, and if I want to uh, go into there, so there's something from uh, my Windows home directory and all the source for different projects that I generally have worked on in the past. Okay. Okay, so uh, yeah, I do have a lot more in here, <laughs> but I'm not, I just put it in in case we got there. Other stuff you'll do with file names is globbing. So, um, so I have files here, a.py, b.py, c.py. Um, it's a little long to write out all of them as I'm, do, as I'm copying them over. So I can use a pattern, which a lot of you will have seen, star.py. And that copies every Python file into source. Okay. Um, other globbing things, there's a question. So star will match any string of any length. Um, so if I just do cp star into it, it'll try and copy every single file. Okay. Um, so, and you can also R for recursive with cp. So I've copied that into my own source directory. And so in my source directory now, in, in home, I have the study group as well as all of the files. So star will just match everything. Once you add the dot pi, it says only things that start with any string and end with dot pi. Um, question mark matches a single character. Um, square brackets will match any of the characters within square brackets. So for instance, if I want to copy uh, every file with A in it, then I can do cp star A or, A or B, say. Um, and look in source, and I now have uh, everything that contained A or B in the title. Apparently, very few had B. So globbing, can, you can do a fair amount with it. Basically, it just give, returns a list of all of the file names as command line arguments. Um, but you've probably seen that before if you've worked with Bash before. Now we're going to get into some of the more powerful stuff as we approach the end. So um, some of the true strengths of uh, the command line are from actually combining commands together. Um, you may have noticed that we have a bunch of commands that do little things, like one searches through files. One uh, will print out the first so many lines of it. Um, by using pipes, you can join them to, you can plug in the, the input from another. So if you've used R, um, with a dplyr package, I've, I know uh, some of you might use that. Uh, the concept of pipes that they have there is the same as the concept of pipes from uh, Bash. I believe that's where they got the idea. So um, 
we'll uh, let's go through a few of these examples. Okay. So if I go, if I just do head animals, then it gives me uh, the first 10 animals as we saw before. Okay. If I do cat animals, cat is um, concatenate. It just shows you the list of all the files, really, or the contents of a file. So if I use cat, it will show me all of the contents. If I use the pipe character and go cat, animals, and then pipe it into head, then it shows me the first 10 animals in the file. So it shows me the first 10 animals in whatever stream that I give it. OK. Um, Another example is if I do list the files and pipe it into head with two, it will give me the first two files that LS gives in whatever sorting it gives. So if I sort it by, then it'll give me the two largest um, files in the current directory. Okay. Um, I'll do this. This one is kind of a trickier one. If I just type in head, um, then I'm left with a blinking cursor on one side of the screen. And so the reason why that's happening is because it's expecting input, but it hasn't received any yet. If there's no file name, it's going to wait for input. So I can just type in the input some stuff until it reaches 10 lines of input, and then it goes. OK, so this can be useful for cat as well. If I use cat, it will just accept things as input until I'm done, um, which is an end line character, control D, D as in dog. Okay. And finally, um, so if you remember, what does or grep fish animals will search for fish in the animals file, right? Okay, so we see all of the different type of fish. What you can also do is pipe it to WC or word count. Um, and dash L will give you the number of lines. So if I do the previous command, animals, and then pipe it into WC, I get that there are 20 animals or with fish in its name. Does that make sense to people? So I've basically um, searched for all of the lines in the file that have the substring fish. And then I've sent that output into uh, WC, which counts the number of lines in this case, and then prints out the number of lines. OK. Yeah. Yeah, so. Um, I, I didn't linger on the man page for WC long earlier, but it actually uh, prints new line word and byte counts for each file. So if I um, if I did the same thing without that dash L command line argument, it would give me three numbers. The first one is the number of lines. The second one is the number of words, which is close to the same because there's only one animal per line. And then the last one is the number of bytes, which includes spaces. So it's all the characters, including spaces and new line characters and tab characters and stuff like that. Um, and it, if we go into WC, you can also um, see that if I do dash C, it will give the byte count. Dash M will put, print the character count. Uh, Dash capital L will give the maximum length of a line. 
um, dash w will give the words. So I can find the longest name of a jellyfish, or of a fish, which is probably that Irukanji jellyfish, uh, by using capital L. So apparently the longest name of an animal with fish in it is 19 letters, including a space. Uh, so um, all of these little commands do simple things on their own, but the once you string them together, they can be fairly powerful. Um, another thing you can do, which is also quite useful for record keeping, is uh, just writing the output directly to a file. So that uses the um, angle or the greater than sign. Okay, a single greater than sign will overwrite the file. Uh, two greater than signs will um, just append the contents. So in this example, we do the same thing as before. Look for fish. This time, let's say, look for dog in animals. OK. And then I can uh, write those directly into list of dogs. OK. So no, nothing is output because all the output is redirected. But then if I uh, look at the contents, there's apparently just a prairie dog. Yeah. OK. Um, you can also, oh, yeah, so one thing I didn't cover in much detail is that we call the input standard in and the output standard out. Um, if you've seen C programming at all, you'll terms. Sometimes you come up with them in Python and other languages. Um, so you can also uh, take files and put them directly into standard in. So um, it, I don't actually do this much because most of the commands I use will take a file name as an argument. But uh, I can do grep fish and then an arrow pointing the other way to say that I want to put the animals file into standard in. And it will use animals as the input. The difference is so subtle that it pro it's hard to think of. I have trouble thinking of an example where it uh, actually matters, except for when I'm writing my own code. And I would just use input. Like if you're in Python and you use the input command with no prompt, that's expecting it from standard in. So instead of opening up a file, like reading the command line arguments and opening up the file, you can just do this and give it the, all of the inputs for whatever code you want to run. This is good if you've got some kind of interactive program and you want to automate it. You can just put any inputs in, in the interactive prompts into a text file and pipe it in through standard in, and it'll repeat the same thing every time. OK. Um, another one. So another one is standard error. This is where error uh, codes go. So I don't have a specific example of this, but if you've got a compiler that gives warnings, or sometimes if you run a Python program, there will be errors associated with it. Um, if you want to uh, copy all, all of those to a file without having them show on screen, you can put a 2 beside the um, symbol beside the greater than symbol and that will say take the standard error and write it to a file the output will still be written to a file so because there's no error in this command all of my output is still written and if i look at error file there's nothing in it if there had been an error um, then it would go in there. So let's see if k is here. Yeah, so there I gave it an improper command line option. 
Um, so then the error was written for that file. That's also good if you want to keep track of what errors come up and be able to look back at them later. Okay. Um, good. And so other common things that you'll use or that you might use, but I've seen a lot in practice, is um, uh, sometimes you'll have a command with a lot of output. Um, in this case, the easiest one for me to do is just uh, the minerals file. So tons of output in this command. But what I can do is pipe it to less, and it'll show me, and it'll let me scroll through it just like I would a man page. So I can do page up, page down, up and down, search for the letter Z, um, as we covered before with this slash, and quit viewing it. Okay. Um, so uh, that will happen sometimes if you run a program and find that, oh, it's overflowing the screen. You can either save it into a file and then view it with a text editor, or you could use less to just view it. Um, we've got, you can also uh, join files with cat or concatenate them. So cutting animals and minerals and putting into a uh, major general. Um, I look at animals. Then it has 435 lines. If I look at minerals, it has 1,500 lines. There are a lot of minerals in the world. And if I um, look at the major general file, if the number of lines should add up um, to the sum of the previous two. And if I look at the head of major general, it's animals. And if I look at the tail, it's the last of the minerals. So um, back in the day, you could actually do full text editing <laughs> like that. No one really does that anymore. Uh, you can also you echo things to the end of the file. So if I go echo put this at the end and the two arrows into some file, and then I look at what's in some file. And I have this is some file and put this at the end is at the end. If I do that again, then it's there twice. And then um, you can also search and replace in a file. So I mentioned said is useful um, for that kind of thing. It uses so these funny looking commands like s, which means substitute. Cat is the thing to look for. Dog is what you replace it with. And G means uh, everywhere it appears in the line. So if I do that command, then I have the file cats, or no cats. And if, <laughs> And you'll note that I didn't have capitalization there. But if I grep for cats in no cats, I should have nothing. Okay. Whereas if I look for dogs in it, it's changed. Uh, sorry, there shouldn't be the S. If I look for dog, then I get like a bob dog instead of a bob cat. Sabertooth dog, which I'd like to see. OK. Um, there are other ways to run multiple commands in a line. Uh, a semicolon works the same as pressing enter between two. Essentially, two ampersands is, um, it's like in Python, if you use and, it will 
execute the first, and if the first is false, then it'll give the second. So if there's an error with the first command, it won't run the second command. Um, I can show that with, if I do grep, and, and echo, it worked. So I'll just move that to the top. So if I look for fish, the word fish in animals, and then if it works, I'll echo it worked. And so you can see at the bottom it worked. But if I had some kind of error, so if I search for something that wasn't in animals, grep returns a fail. So you don't see that it worked. Likewise, I can if I use or, which is indicated by a double pipe, uh, fail. Then, because it didn't work, it outputs fail, and it would have worked. It wouldn't have done fail otherwise. Okay. And then um, a tricky one. Uh, which I actually have less use for on this computer because it's Windows, is um, a single ampersand. What that does is it runs the previous command in the background. So if I, this is kind of a horrible example, but if I said vim and then I did ampersand, and press enter, then vim is just kind of in the background. In this case, it stopped. Um, other ones will keep running. Uh, so let's. So the, uh, those background jobs can be seen using uh, the command uh, FG. Don't know what FG uh, stands for. I think it's foreground. Yes, foreground. Okay. And so you can see all of the things in the background by typing in jobs. Um, here's a fun command. Yes. It just keeps outputting Y until it gets told to stop. Okay. So if I go yes and, and try to use it, then that's getting in the way. But because it's in the background, <laughs> I've basically boned my <laughs> terminal. <laughs> but I could go FG, enter. It would bring it into the foreground, and then Control c to stop it. <laughs> so um, it's, running things in the background is especially useful if you're on Linux or Mac, and you want to run a program that's a graphic interface, but you don't want it to stop you from accessing the terminal to enter in commands. Um, I could go on and start talking about more of the scripting, like variables in, and loops. But uh, I think it's, we're about out of time. So to wrap up, you can start. You've hopefully started to see how you can start combining things in really powerful ways. And there are lots of tools. Um, I would never expect. Or, and I often forget the names of commands. So uh, one thing that I did a lot in um, this, in making this lesson, is actually uh, do stuff like um, prepend to a file in Bash. And it turns out that there's no good way of prepending to a file in a in a shell, except by creating a temporary file and combining the two files that way. You can. You can add stuff to the end of files easily, but not at the beginning. Okay. Um, th things to look into in the future. I've got a little bit here about uh, variables, um, like environment variables, such as your path. Um, loops. So if you want to do a command for every file, then uh, loops are good. For instance, this script will prepend a license preamble to every 
Python script that you have in your current directory. Um, you can also, because Bash is a scripting language, just like Python or R or Perl, you can actually write your own scripts. Um, so there's a little bit about that in there. And you can execute them the same way as uh, Python or whatever. And then um, as you get to use the command line more and more, um, one of the big things to learn is regular expressions, because a whole lot of tools will use regular expressions. It's basically a fancy way of writing search queries. So you can search for everything that looks like a URL. And if you usually you would find that regular expression online, stick that into grep, and then it would pull all of the URLs from a file. Um, you can do uh, similar things for pretty much just about any string you can imagine. Uh, the only thing, the main failure of regular expressions is they don't match brackets. But um, that's a surprisingly low bar. So um, there are also really powerful commands that I personally don't use as much, like find to find and do something with every file in the directory and all subdirectories, and exargs, which lets you compose outputs from one command to create new commands and run them, um, which is uh, surprisingly powerful. So uh, yes, I think that's everything I can talk about today. Sorry for going a little long. <laughs>